Hi, I'm Alex Morton, pastor of Firebrand Fellowship, and I'm coming to you live tonight with a message called The Rapture, The Battle, and The New Kingdom. We'll be speaking about end time events tonight, and the reason I put this message together is because of the lack of knowledge when it comes to the last days and end time events. Um, I was raised up believing that any day Jesus would come back, any moment he could come back, and that's the truth. And I want to share with you tonight some things that God has revealed to me through his word and through his spirit. So I'm going to wait for a few people to jump on here, um, and I'm just going to pray as we get started. Father, I thank you for giving me this message, Lord, once again, imparting revelation and impartation to me, Lord God, that I may teach, that I may preach, that I may reveal the secrets of the kingdom, that I may reveal this wisdom, this knowledge, Lord, about the end, end times and and these last uh, seasons, this last hour that we're living in, Father. So tonight I ask that you anoint my lips, Lord. Anoint my lips for service that I may speak your message by the power of your Holy Spirit. I don't want to speak my words. I just want to speak yours, Lord. Only yours. So Jesus, come tonight and manifest yourself. Manifest your glory, Lord. And may those who are watching receive impartation and revelation tonight as I teach on this subject, Father. Please open the eyes of those who are blinded, Lord. Awaken those who have been asleep. Awaken those who have, the enemy has blinded through sin and through deceitfulness in these last days. Lord, give them revelation. Shine the light of Christ on them. Just as, as Saul uh, had scales over his eyes and they fell and he became, uh, he, he became blind, but then he could see, Father, because of the light that shined, he was blinded, but then he could see through the power of the Holy Spirit. When the Spirit came upon him, he could see again. So Lord, tonight I ask that those who are watching, those who have been blinded by the enemy, that the Spirit of God would come and restore their sight. We thank you, Lord. So first, like I said, I put this message together because of the lack of knowledge concerning the end times, concerning the last days out there. A lot of people have been asking me, what is the rapture? And what are these different end time events that have to happen before the end? I can't take the time to cover everything. There's no way I'd have the time to cover every end time event, every single thing that happens in the book of Revelation. There's a whole lot of material in there, but I'm going to cover the basics. I'm going to cover what happens from here right on until the new kingdom and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cover most of the basic events that must happen beginning with the rapture. So there are many out there who don't want to learn about the end times because they're scared. And they think it's a scary thing. But the truth is, for believers, this is a very exciting time. Because it means that our redemption draws near. It means that Jesus is closer than ever before. Jesus is closer to coming for his people and rapturing us, catching us up into the clouds with him and taking us into his kingdom. It's closer than ever before. Jesus, I believe, is standing on the edge of heaven, getting ready to jump. Hallelujah. So the truth is that for believers, this is an exciting time. Only an orphan who does not know their spiritual father should be afraid in these times. Only one who is living in the guilt and shame of sin should be shaken, but not heirs of a heavenly inheritance. Those who have an inheritance, those who are heirs in Christ, and we are sons and daughters. If you're a believer and follower of Jesus Christ, you're a son, you're a daughter, and you don't have to be afraid in these last days. So not the redeemed who've been bought with a price. We don't have to be afraid. Not those who've been cleansed by the shed blood of our Savior. I've had more people asking, about, asking me about the end times and about the rapture in the past six months than I ever have before in my entire life. These street corner preachers that hold up the sign saying the end is near, many people think they're nuts or they, they thought they were crazy until now. I never thought they were crazy. But 
a lot of times people think they're crazy out of ignorance. But I was raised on end times teachings. In fact, like I said in the very beginning of this message, my mother taught me to believe that Jesus is coming back at any moment. And that is the truth. So there seems to be a new movement in the church today that dismisses the rapture altogether. And I don't understand where that comes from because I see the rapture clearly laid out in scripture. And we're going to look at some of those scriptures tonight that talk about the rapture, that talks about when Jesus appears in the sky, he appears in the clouds, and we are caught up with him. So this seems... uh, so wait, hold on. Let's turn with right now. I feel a little light in a different direction. Let's turn to First Thessalonians. Now, this is the first scripture that I want to talk about that refers to the rapture. First Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18. First Thessalonians 4, verses 13 through 18. Oh, thank you, Father. We thank you for your spirit. Kita ramba shatara kito ramba she. Hallelujah. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18. But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who do not have hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring him or will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself would ascend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together, with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore comfort one another with these words. This is to comfort us. Paul is saying this is something that we can comfort one another with. These words. Hallelujah. You see he's referring to being caught up in the clouds. This is a direct reference to the rapture. Notice Paul begins by telling the Thessalonians he doesn't want them to be ignorant. To be ignorant about the rapture takes away from the comfort Jesus desires for us to experience while we patiently wait for the bridegroom. And the picture um, that I posted where the woman is looking out the window and watching buildings burn down and she's watching this devastation, she's watching this destruction. The reason why I put that and posted that on Facebook as my promotion is because it's a picture of the bride looking out and waiting on the bridegroom, waiting for Jesus' return, watching the destruction, watching the things that are taking place, but still having a super natural peace on the inside saying I am waiting for my bridegroom and I know the moment is coming I know it draws nigh I know my salvation and my redemption draws near so Paul writes that some have already fallen asleep he doesn't want the Thessalonians he doesn't want the Thessalonians to be deceived he doesn't want them to neglect the belief in the resurrection hello to everybody that's jumping on hi April Paul Maria Kim, thank you for joining us tonight. Jeremy, thank you for joining us, brothers and sisters. There are saints that have already passed into eternity, and they are with Jesus even now. Their bodies lay in graves and in the sea and are scattered throughout the earth. When the trumpet blasts, their bodies will be caught up, and so will every true follower and believer of Jesus Christ when the rapture takes place. Scripture says we will meet them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Revelation 1.7 says this, Look, he is coming with the clouds and every eye will see him. Even those who pierced him and all peoples on earth will mourn because of him. So shall it be. Amen. At the moment Jesus appears in the sky, every, everyone across the earth will see him. Every eye shall see him. All those who rejected Jesus as Messiah will be cut to the heart with conviction and grief. The saints will be caught up, will will fly, 
on that day will fly up. We'll be able to fly on that day. Hallelujah. Some of the people who are left behind will believe on Jesus after they've witnessed this event. Some will be backslidden Christians. Some, uh, some of them will have been told what was to come. So some of these people will be people that I spoke to, that you spoke to, that some of the brothers and sisters that we know spoke to. But they didn't believe in Jesus. They didn't believe in the rapture. But after the rapture takes place, some of these people will then begin to believe. And some of the Jewish people in Israel and throughout the earth will realize the Messiah they've been waiting for has already come. They will repent at the appearance of Christ coming in the clouds. And what a sweet time of reconciliation that will be with God's people in Israel as they unite, as they come together for the true Messiah, and they are reconciled to the Father. Others will be convicted of sin, but they will refuse to repent. Revelation 9, 20 and 21 says, But the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues, because plagues will be released, wrath, the wrath of God will be released during the tribulation period, did not repent, Let's jump back to the scripture. Did not repent of the works of their hands that they should not worship demons and idols of gold, silver, brass, stone, and wood, which can neither see nor hear or walk. And they did not repent of their murders or their sorceries or their sexual immorality or their thefts. Now to address the question most ask, when will the rapture take place? So I personally believe that the rapture will take place before the, before the tribulation. Some believe it will happen in the middle of the tribulation, about three and a half years in, and we're going to talk about uh, what happens at the middle of the tribulation. Some talk about it happening, the rapture happening toward the end of the tribulation. There's pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib, and there's all these things, but I once heard a preacher say, I'm pan-trib, which means everything's going to pan out, and I agree with that. You know, it's my personal opinion that it will be a pre-trib rapture, which means before the tribulation, but it's really not clear in Scripture. So I do not jump out on a limb and say this is what's going to happen when it's unclear when that will take place. But I know if we have to live through part of the tribulation, if we have to live through the tribulation, God is going to keep his hand on us. And I've shared stories about God's divine protection that's been on my life. And he's going to protect you. And if something does happen to you, if you have to suffer, because there's going to be times where we have to suffer. If you have to suffer, God is going to give you the strength, the courage, and everything you need to live through that. We thank you, Lord, for your sweet presence. We thank you for your ministering spirits and your angels, Lord God. So what I mean by that is it will actually happen. So the rapture will actually happen, and it is imminent. As many of you know, I've received dreams and visions about the last days, about the end times, and all of my prophetic dreams and visions line up with the Word of God. And I personally believe that what is happening in our world right now is a covert strategy, covert strategy to usher in the new world order. Hey, Mikkel, thanks for joining us. Hey, Victoria, thank you for joining us. So all of my prophetic dreams and visions, like I said, line up with the Word of God, and you can test me on that. There are others that are now saying this, but I warned in dreams and visions of what was to come. I've been saying this since the initial lockdown period, and I believe there's a lot more uh, chaos, and I believe there's more lockdowns to come. They may not be right now. I know some, some places are locking down again, and I don't like talking too much about COVID and all that because I want this to be a, a stress-free zone. I want this to be a fear, uh, fear-free fear zone. I'm not about fear. I'm about, I'm about living in the liberty and freedom that God has given me through the power of His Spirit. The enemy wants you locked up in fear. The enemy wants you in your own mental prison, but God wants you free. So the Antichrist will soon rise and promise peace. He will speak blasphemies against God and against Jesus. He will appear to be an angel of light. He'll appear to be a peacemaker and a helper of all mankind. And I know I kind of jumped into the Antichrist, but I'm going to start talking about him. But whether we have to experience more lockdowns, whether we have to experience more suffering, God is going to hold our hand. God is going to walk with us through it. 
He never left you alone and he never will. So don't be afraid. Do not fear. So he'll deceive many. The Antichrist will deceive many by appealing to their evil desires. Those who don't believe the truth of the gospel will believe the lie. And I'm going to give you some scripture references here for when when I'm speaking. I'm going to give you a scripture reference for the next segment here. So when I talk about those who don't believe the truth of the gospel, believing a lie, you can refer to 2 Thessalonians. And I hope you have a paper and pen with you. You can refer to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 10 and 11. We're going to go right through here and go through this segment real quickly. And I want to give you scripture with everything. So one very important thing you should know about the Antichrist is that in the Greek... Antichrist doesn't just mean against Christ, it means in place of Christ. So I believe with all of my heart that the Antichrist will be a copycat of Jesus. He will appear to be Jesus to those who are deceived. The Antichrist will claim to be God. He will display miraculous powers. Revelation 13.13 13 is a reference for that. He will over, or excuse me, he will even have scars to deceive people and cause them to believe he's been resurrected, that he's been crucified and resurrected. He'll even have scars. Revelation 13, 12 is a reference for that. The Antichrist will rule over the entire earth. He will force all people to take his mark to buy and sell. That is in Revelation 13, verses 16 and 17. There will be those who are saved during the tribulation who refuse the mark of the beast. And are executed. And still others that are protected. So some will be martyred. Some will have to lay down their lives. But that price is a price that some will have to pay. Jesus lay down his life. So we have to lay down everything that we are. Everything that we possess. And possibly even our own lives. I'm not saying everybody will become a martyr. During the tribulation. But there will be some who will have to pay that ultimate price. Some of God's chosen people who will be protected through the tribulation are the 144,000 virgin Jews. You know, people ask about that number of people that are protected in the book of Revelation. And the book of Revelation says there are 144,000 virgin Jews. And remember, there's a lot of deception out there already. There's been deception from the beginning. From the beginning of time, Lucifer has always found his servants that would come to try to deceive the believers, to come to try to deceive the people of God, and that hasn't changed. There's the Jehovah Witnesses, there's the Mormons, there's all kinds of cults that are going to try to twist Scripture and give you an altered version of the truth. But you want the 100% truth that's in this Bible. This is the true Word of God, 100% true Word of God. So the Jehovah Witnesses will tell you only 144,000 people will enter into heaven and the rest will stay in this dismal kind of limbo, which is one of the strangest things that I've ever heard in my life. 144,000 is the number of virgin Jews who will be protected that will be converts to Christianity, they will they will understand that Jesus is the Messiah and they'll be protected during the tribulation. And there will be 12,000 from each tribe that believes in Messiah and begins to follow him during the tribulation and is protected. In the, and the reference for that is Revelation chapter 7 verses 1 through 8. The 144,000 in Israel will be marked with a seal on their foreheads which contains the name of Jesus and God's name. It actually says the name of Jesus and God's name will be marked on their head. This seal guarantees their protection. And remember, there's going to be a mark of the beast. There's also going to be the mark of God on these 144,000. So the mark of the beast, again, is a counterfeit of the mark that's put on these virgin Jew believers. The enemy always tries to counterfeit everything God is doing. Everything God has done, everything that God is, the devil tries to counterfeit, but it's just a cheap imitation. You can never come close to the Lord. You can never come close to the Lord of hosts, the Holy Ghost, hallelujah. In the middle of the seven-year tribulation, the Antichrist declares that he is God and desecrates the temple in Jerusalem. 
All right, this is a huge turning point. When the, when the Antichrist desecrates the temple in Jerusalem, we know that the temple is not yet rebuilt, but could quickly be constructed or reconstructed. The Antichrist will set up the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel, which I believe will be a statue of himself within the temple. And I'm not the only preacher that believes that, but I believe that the Antichrist will set up a statue of himself in the temple and that will be the abomination of desolation with which Daniel spoke of and which Jesus himself spoke of. This abomination of desolation. There's others that believe it will be something else. There's others that will believe that he that um that the Antichrist will will kill pigs in the Holy of Holies or something like that that would be considered unclean. But this is what I believe, and I I can only tell you what I believe. I can only tell you my view, but these things I believe to be the truth. So at this time, at this time, over half the Earth's, tr uh, the Earth's population will be dead, which is three and a half years into the tribulation, halfway through the tribulation, half of the Earth's population will be dead. If you count up all the, the um, different plagues and the wrath that's poured out, and it says... Uh, one third will be killed at one point, and then if you add up all the casualties at this point, half of the earth will be dead at this point. And at this point, about three and a half years into the tribulation period, things are going to heat up like never before. The Jewish people in Jerusalem will flee into the mountains, and there will be war and destruction in Israel until the end. During the tribulation period, the wrath of God will be poured out on those who refuse to turn from sin. In the midst of their torment, God will continue to extend grace to those who would repent and be saved. So Romans 10, 13 says, Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Why would we not call on the name of the Lord and be saved? If you're not saved now, if you're backslidden, if you don't know where you are with God, Repent and be saved. Give your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the way, the truth, and the life. He's changed my life. He's delivered me from death. He's delivered me from prison. I, I was almost sentenced to life in prison. The Lord delivered me from so many things. He delivered me when I was being pulled into hell once, literally by demons. I'm telling you, He's the real deal. He's the real thing. And we need to get right with God. Because at any moment, Jesus could return. And we could enter into the tribulation period, which is not a time you want to be around for. At the end of the tribulation period, there will be a culmination of all things. Jerusalem will be surrounded by armies from every nation. They will stage themselves for the battle at Megiddo, for the battle of Armageddon. So as the armies prepare to strike... Jesus descends. Let's turn to Zechariah chapter 12. And a lot of you may not know that Jesus is in the Old Testament, but he's all through the Old Testament. He is all through it, especially in Zechariah. I would challenge you to read that book. And once you know Jesus and you look back into the Old Testament, you can see the Old Testament through a new lens where you see Jesus just jump off the pages so Zechariah is very a uh, very special book to me. So let's go to Zechariah chapter 12 because I found Jesus all through this book. Zechariah chapter 12 verses 2 through 14. This is a long stretch of scripture. Stick with me, please. Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of drunkenness to all the surrounding peoples when they lay siege against Judah and Jerusalem. And it shall happen in that day that I will make Jerusalem a very heavy stone for all peoples, and all who would heave it away will surely be cut in pieces, though all nations of the earth are gathered against it. In that day, says the Lord, I will strike every horse with confusion, and its rider with madness. I will open my eyes on the house of Judah, and will strike every horse of the peoples with blindness." And the governors of Judah shall say in their heart, The inhabitants of Jerusalem are my strength in the Lord of hosts, their God. In that day I will make the government, or excuse me, I will make the governors of Judah like a fire pan in the woodpile. 
and like a fiery torch in the sheaves. They shall devour all the surrounding peoples on the right hand and on the left, but Jerusalem shall be inhabited again in her own place, Jerusalem. The Lord will save the tents of Judah first, so that the glory of the house of David and the glory of the inhabitants of Jerusalem shall not become greater than that of Judah. In the day of the Lord, in that day of the Lord, will defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem. The one who is feeble among them in that day shall be like David, and the house of David shall be like God, like the angel of the Lord before them. It shall be in that day that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. And I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication that they will look on me whom they pierced. Yes, they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son and grieve for him as one grieves for a, force, for a firstborn. In that day there shall be a great mourning in Jerusalem like the mourning at Hadad Raman in the plain of Megiddo. And the land shall mourn, and every family by itself, the family of the house of David itself, and the wife, their wives by themselves, the family of the house of Nathan by itself, and their wives by themselves, the family of the house of Levi by itself, and their wives by themselves, the family of Shemel by itself, and their wives by themselves, and the families that remain, every family by itself, and their wives by themselves. This is talking about the clans, the tribes of Jerusalem, the tribes of Israel repenting and crying out saying look at this one whom we have pierced he has come he is come he is there he is there above us and he has come and we have pierced him and they will mourn and they will feel this great conviction and grief so the Lord strikes the horses with panic, the riders with madness, the riders with insanity and he promises to consume the surrounding nations so verse 9 says, On that day he will set out to destroy all the nations that attack Jerusalem. We know that when God sets out to accomplish something, it will be done. Amen? It will be done. On that day Jesus will annihilate all of his enemies. And pay close attention to verse 10. The Lord says that they will look on me, as I just spoke about, the one whom they have pierced. And they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only child. Not only is this more evidence of Christ's deity from the Old Testament, it speaks of a final awakening in Israel where all of Israel will see their Messiah and their Lord clearly displayed as they mourn and are saved. I believe this same Jesus who was hung on a cross, will walk among them in that day. It's an amazing, awesome, glorious thing that we're speaking about right now. It's when Jesus returns to annihilate his enemies and set up the kingdom of heaven on earth. So revealing his nail-scarred hands as an eternal reminder of just how far he would go to be reconciled with this lost and dying world. This will be the beginning of a new era, a transitioning, coming one step closer to the kingdom God has always intended for us, the world God has always intended for us, without death, without pain, without suffering. Let's go to Revelation chapter 20. Verses 4 through 6. Revelation chapter 20, verses 4 through 6. And I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received the mark on their foreheads or hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years, but the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. 
Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. So I refer to this period of a thousand years as the honeymoon period. And I've never heard someone refer to it as that, but I believe that this is a transitional period where God wants to become acquainted with his people in the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus will literally establish his kingdom on earth. After 1,000 years, all those who are not found in the Lamb's book of life will be thrown into everlasting fire. The lake of fire. Sorry, I had to decline a call there. And I want you to know this is called the white throne judgment. So there will be a thousand years, and after that period of time, the enemy, the devil, will be released from prison, from his prison, from the abyss, one more time to deceive those who will still be deceived. Think about it. After a thousand years with Jesus, God basically wants to weed out those who will allow themselves to be deceived. Because at that point, Jesus has convinced them uh, to a belief that is so solid. He's convinced them to a point where they're so solid in knowing Him, in knowing all of the kingdom of God, that God will allow the dragon to be released one more time to see who will be deceived. And I know you don't hear about that on Sunday a lot of the time. I don't know any preacher that's preached that, but it's in the Bible. There'll be a thousand year honeymoon period, I call it, where we'll get to know Jesus, where we'll walk with him and talk with him before the new heaven and the new earth are established. But after that thousand years, the devil will be released one more time to deceive those he can deceive and take them into the lake of fire with him. And the white throne judgment is when those who are not found in the Lamb's book of life are thrown into the lake of fire that burns forever. And I say that holding back tears because I don't see, want to see anyone go there. I don't want to see anyone, not my worst enemy, go to hell. So I'm going to give you an opportunity to know Jesus, to receive Jesus, I should say, as your personal Lord and Savior at the end of this message. You don't want to receive the wrath of God. Why receive His wrath when you can receive His love? which is greater than, than any other love, which is greater than any human type of love, anything we could experience in this life. And after the white throne judgment, the new heaven and the new earth and the new kingdom will be established forevermore. With all the war and suffering we see today, we can be filled with hope, knowing that Jesus will establish an everlasting kingdom among his people. Let's read one more portion of scripture together, and that is Revelation chapter 21, verses 1 through 6. Revelation chapter 21, verses 1 through 6. I'll give you a minute to get there. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them. And be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more crying. There, or, there shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I will make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give of the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. 
So are you thirsty? Do you want this water of life that Jesus freely gives? He don't want you feeding on that poison. He doesn't want you feeding on that dirty, impure water, that dirty, impure imitation that the devil offers every single day. He wants you to drink of the water of life that will revive you, that will breathe life into you, that will give you peace and satisfaction from now until eternity. So I'm going to give you an opportunity now to receive Jesus and get your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And at the end of this message, I'm going to leave uh, some time that you can ask questions about what I spoke about. I'm sure some of you have questions about the end times. And if we don't have time, or if you just don't want to ask a question on here, you can send me a direct message on Facebook, Instagram, or on my public figure page. However you want to contact me, please contact me and ask me your questions. But I'm going to give you an opportunity right now to receive Christ as Lord and Savior or to recommit your life to Him if you've been backslidden, if you walked away from Him. So please follow me in this prayer and believe in your heart the things that you're saying. So repeat after me if you want to receive Jesus or if you want to give your life back to Him. Father God, I believe that Jesus is your Son. I believe he died on the cross for my sins. Please, Lord, forgive me of my sins. Wash me and cleanse me by your spirit and by your blood. I believe that Jesus rose from the grave and that he lives forevermore. Lord, give me the courage and all that I need to follow you for all of my days. Give me the courage that I need to speak about you and share your great love with all who come my way. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. You see, I'm trying to make evangelists right there. I'm trying to, to impart boldness, trying to impart some of what God's given me that you may step out in boldness and preach the gospel with those, with those who come your way, with those who are in your job, who are in your workplace, who are your friends and family members, because a lot of the time we keep our mouths shut because we're shy or we're timid or we're afraid of looking stupid, we're afraid of looking foolish, but the truth is everything about thinking we're going to look foolish or being embarrassed is rooted in pride. It's rooted in pride and worrying about what people think. We can't worry about what people think and what God thinks at the same time. So choose Christ. Choose to care more about God's opinion than the opinions of people. Because people are always going to have an opinion. There's a million different opinions out there, but God's is the only one that matters. So allow God to purify and cleanse you. How do we prepare for the return of the Lord? A woman at Wawa I was witnessing to actually asked me that question. How do we prepare? How do we get ready for the return of Christ? Well, it's very simple. Keep yourself clean before God. Come to the Lord each day. And not in a neurotic way, not in a way that's going to make you crazy, but in a way that you're just offering yourself to the Lord each day and saying, Lord, I open myself up to you. Take a look at my heart, examine me, and help me to examine myself. In any way that I've sinned, Lord, f please forgive me. And things that I don't, maybe I don't know how I sinned, maybe I don't know what I've done. But Lord, show me what I'm doing. Show me if I'm putting idols before you. Show me the error of my way that I may correct it, that I may offer it up to you. Lord, and you stay clean before the Lord by coming to him each day and just laying everything out before him and humbling yourself before him. And the Bible talks about the wise virgins, the foolish virgins and the wise virgins that were waiting for the bridegroom. And the wise ones had their lamps filled with oil, which represents the Holy Spirit. That means continually be filled with the Holy Spirit. Allow yourself to be filled with the Holy Spirit. A lot of the time, we resist the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit wants to have His way in us. The Holy Spirit is just as much God 
as the Father and the Son. The Holy Spirit wants to purify us, wants to lead us in truth, in righteousness, in holiness. He will do things that will blow your mind every single time. He will give you dreams, visions, revelation. He'll show you things about your future. He'll show you things about your destiny. He'll equip you for the work of the Lord. So allow him to have his way. Hey, Paul, thank you for joining us. Hey, Maria, thank you for joining us. How are you guys? Um, so this is the part of the message where I'm going to open it up. And anyone who has a question about the last days, end times, events, prophecies, whatever, if I can answer your question, I will. If not, I'm going to do more research and I'll get back to you. But I believe that I can answer the majority of the questions that will come up, I, I think and I hope anyway, um, since I've done countless hours of research and study on the end times. So please put your questions up there right now. Don't be shy. There's no stupid question. There's no bad question. There's, there's nothing too short, too simple. Just put your questions up there. I'll just give a couple minutes. Okay, thank you, Maria, for watching. Thank you, everyone who's watched and tuned in. We've had quite a few people jump on for this message tonight. And uh, I'll just wait for questions. And while I wait, I'm just going to talk about this wolf that's behind me. So I put, uh, you might be wondering, you know, that seems a little little creepy or whatever. I don't know, but I put this this backdrop of a wolf up. Because it reminds me of one of the times that the Lord uh, showed me, or the, the first time I really got a revelation that I was supposed to move in deliverance. But I didn't know what it meant at first. So I'm going to tell you about that um, while I'm waiting for questions. And if I don't get any questions, I'll jump off of here in a minute. And at 8 o'clock, we're going to do a Zoom session. If you'd like to be a part of that prayer and discussion Zoom session, please join us. The link is on, on this page. Uh, it should be right on the page when you look at it, um, right beneath this message. But anyway, I had a dream. I was in Greaterford Prison. It was my first night in Greaterford Prison um, when I was facing a whole lot of time, and I got a short sentence by the grace of God. But I was in I was in there my first night. You know, it was a crazy. It's a crazy uh, prison. I believe they closed it now, but it's a very dangerous place. And I just prayed, Lord, protect me in here, Lord. And uh, I remember being up late that night, my first night, and I just prayed that the Lord would protect me and keep me wrapped up in his presence. And I had given my life back to the Lord uh, a couple months before that in prison. And that night I had this dream where I was walking up a mountainside and this wolf came out of nowhere and start growling at me, barking at me. And I think it's going to try to attack me. And all of a sudden in the dream, I put my hand on the top of the wolf's head and it sits down and becomes tame as if an evil spirit in it had left and it became completely tame. And I didn't know what it meant, but I felt the Holy Spirit come on me in that dream. And when I woke up, I was at perfect peace and I was totally calm, to actually filled with joy. And I smiled all day because the presence of God came on me in that dream. And everybody on that cell block was looking at me like I was nuts because I was the only one smiling the way uh, that I was that day. And for actually for a couple of days. So the Lord revealed to me in that dream that, that there'll be danger all around me, but none of it would touch me. And later the Lord showed me that that meant I had a deliverance anointing. That dream God was showing me that I would tame, uh, tame situations that seemed so dangerous, that seemed like, like everything was, was coming uh, to a head and was going to destroy me. But by the Spirit of God that He's given me, that God's given me, I will cast out many devil spirits, many demonic spirits, and I have, and I will continue to because that is part of the authority that God's given to me and every believer. Praise God. Hallelujah. So I don't see any questions, guys. Um, I'm going to close this out. Thank you so much for joining me tonight. And I pray that this message has imparted revelation to you and understanding into the end times. You have a blessed and wonderful night.